Well, great. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a real pleasure to welcome you uh, for this panel on diversity and innovation. Not a much better topic to kick off uh, our afternoon after the presentations of Executive Vice President Vestaya and Commissioner Maria Gabriel. I uh, usually uh, make the argument when I'm traveling to the United States uh, that uh, Europe is not at all fragmented, but we are indeed quite diverse. But I think this diversity is uh, 27 different research and innovation cultures and in the area of innovation and research where ideas need to come together and be exchanged. It is, I would argue, a particular European asset. And we will explore in the panel um, with um, our panelists uh, how indeed um, diversity is an asset uh, in innovation. The gender dimension is, of course, a, a critical one, as uh, we will discuss, but it goes, of course, much beyond the gender, uh, and diversity is um, one feature of uh, Europe's ambition to promote innovation uh, policy. So uh, we have a great panel, and I think the idea is, for once, that the moderator does not introduce the panel, but the panelists will have the opportunity now to introduce themselves. And with that introduction, maybe also give us already a first glimpse of how uh, you are looking uh, at this um, question of diversity, gender in innovation. And I have the pleasure to start with um, Maria Leptin, one of the persons most talked about in Brussels these days. She took over her responsibility as president of the European Research Council just a few days ago. And Maria, I'm delighted to have you in the panel with me. Over to you. Thank you, Jean-Éric. Um, it's a great honor and great pleasure to be here. Um, you may wonder why I'm here. Let me introduce myself. My name is Maria Lepton. Um, as Jean-Éric said, I'm now the president of the European Research Council. I'm trained as a basic research scientist in biology, genetics, um, and I'm a professor at the University of Cologne. I've spent my last 12 years um, as the director of the European Molecular Biology Organization, um, and have now transitioned to ERC. Both organizations that select bottom-up science uh, exclusively on the criterion of excellence. Now, as a research scientist, I, of course, understand the need for diversity. The greatest ideas are born when different concepts rub against each other. And it's important for scientists to expose themselves to that. There's no point in exposing yourself to people who are the same age, the same race, the same uh, socio-ethnic background as yourself. You want diversity to succeed in science. And um, the commission has already uh, mentioned it. Uh, the COVID vaccine is, of course, a fantastic example of that. Many, many different branches of research, many of them dating way back, have come together in these people, uh, in, in, in this invention. So I, I'm totally in favor of, um, of diversity and see the absolute need for it. I don't believe we have enough of it, but more of that later. Thank you. Maria, thank you very much. And I move straight to Mark, uh, to Mark Ferguson, head of uh, Science Foundation Ireland, but also uh, president of the uh, first EIC board, now member of the new EIC board, so someone particularly familiar with innovation. So thank you very much and, and thank you uh, for the invitation to speak. I would make two points. First of all, if you look analytically at businesses that are more diverse and more diverse at the top, either in the senior management or in the board, then they are more profitable. So the bottom line is diversity hits the bottom line. You are more profitable if you are more diverse. And that's for the very good reason uh, that Maria has just said, that you basically get different ideas, you get different ideas from different people. And the second point I want to make is that diversity is probably the most fundamental biological principle because natural selection works on diversity. And I always describe innovators as being mutants in the system. And mutants in the system is kind of important. It means that you're there to change, but you're also compatible with the existing system. A bit like the example we heard earlier uh, from the commissioner, how electric cars are taking over from petrol engines. They're disruptive, but they're also in the same game. They're compatible. So diversity is very, very important principle biologically. 
And it's a very important principle for us to embrace in order to make both scientific advances and to translate those advances into innovation, an innovation that is profitable. And the bottom line is, if you're not diverse, you're not going to be so profitable. So think about that when you're putting together your top team for your business. Thank you. Mark, thank you very much. That, I think, is a powerful message. Let's move to a mutant. Uh, Youssef, Youssef, you are an innovator yourself. Yes, I am. Uh, so, Mark, uh, um, it, it, it's, it's a very strong uh, message to say diversity is in the, in the nature. I believe it's not in the nature of the human being to be diverse. And to, to explain why, like, as a human being, we are looking always for safety. And there is no much more safety than to understand what we can expect. And we can understand what we expect if we will know the other person. So we always are looking for the people which thinks like us, look like us, dress also like us. And you, we see that in the universities. But while you will scale a company, which I have done many times already in my last 10 years as an entrepreneur, it's a different game. You do, are not looking for safety in scaling up a company. You are looking for getting the biggest part of the market. And to understand the market, you really understand the diversity. So it's very, very hard to be diverse in, in your own company because it's not in our nature of taking a decision. Anna uh, Barzajic, you are also an entrepreneur, you therefore also a mutant, uh, innovator. What is your take? Well, first of all, thank you for having me here. Um, I am, uh, my name is Anna Barisic. I'm an entrepreneur, early stage investor, ecosystem builder, and newly appointed uh, European Innovation Council board member. And um, before I respond at the point uh, that Yusuf just made, I would like to share an anecdote because this is what we're, we're asked to do um, in this panel. So essentially, I would like to share a story with you about how stereotypes can work for the benefit of stereotyped groups. So uh, before all this COVID mess hit, um, I was invited to the Middle East, uh, to Oman, and uh, for a series of entrepreneurship and investment related activities. And at this final event with all these companies and entrepreneurs there, I realized in the audience is a bunch of girls. This was very unusual for me because we, are, we have so many companies uh, events and so many pitching events. And in reality, we don't get so many girls in the audience. So when I approached them, uh, I found out from them that every girl almost is either a computer scientist or a software engineer. And I was really impressed because I wouldn't expect that in Oman, Muscat. So I asked them, what's the deal here? And they said, look, being a computer scientist, having a startup is a part of the women's role. And the real jobs are in oil and gas industry, which are men's jobs. <laughs> so I think this is a great point where we have the change of the social norms in a society which drives the opportunities for entrepreneurship. And to your point, I totally agree with you. I mean, evolutionary, we are totally prone to intergroup bias. However, we need to be stronger than that because we don't live in caves anymore, you know? So I think we as entrepreneurs, we need to be risk averse. And risk averse means beat the intergroup bias. This is an inter I mean, quite a remarkable anecdote. Thank you very much. Thank you. And maybe we start uh, indeed with, uh, with the gender dimension of diversity. Um, I mean, many say, and I, and I tell it to my daughter as well, that the future is female. Um, what, what, what exactly would that mean uh, for, for you and, and also in your activities? Um, uh, maybe we could elaborate. Anna, can we start with you? Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, I would like to emphasize that I personally think the future belongs to all of us. Right now, we have uh, focus and spotlight on women, but we need to think broader than that in terms of ge uh, geographical diversity, in terms of ethnical diversity. However, right now, if you ask us where we are right now from entrepreneurship and investment point of view, we know that in Europe, 1% of women-led companies receive funding from VCs. Let's rephrase that. This means that 99% of companies in Europe that get VC funding are male-led, okay? 
So I think this is one of the very important points. And it's absolutely not normal because it's not the reflection of the market that we have right now. If we know that in Europe we have more than 30% entrepreneurs of, all, all of the total number of entrepreneurs, if we know that in some age groups uh, women are even more educated than men, um, and if we know that women perform better as entrepreneurs, if we know that uh, you know, they, they run more profitable companies, so I think we need to include this in the equation because in the end we want profitability and it seems women are driving profitability as well. So maybe later I can <laughs> share with you some suggestions that I have about this, not to steal the, this question, but that's my opinion. Yeah, Anna, thank you very much. 1% of, uh, of companies, female-led companies Less. get, get VC funding. I think the EIC is doing a bit better than that, Mark, don't, don't, don't we? Yeah, absolutely. When the EIC pilot started, it was about 19%. It's now close to 25%. The target for the next few years is 35%. That's still not good enough. It's still 50, not 50%, but it's better than it was, which was 19 And I think, you know, you can take a couple of lessons out of some pioneering things we did in the pilot. So, for example, we said that to come to the final pitching event, Uh, there had to be a certain number of female-led companies. So we weren't saying there had to be a certain number of female-led companies that had to be funded. The funding is absolutely on the excellence of the pitch. But in order to get to the final mm -hmm. point, uh, we did that. And it had a big effect. And, you know, that speaks to the underlying principle. I mean, if you look at the publications in this area, often women are more measured. Some people would say understated, but I would say more realistic, more measured in what they do. And therefore, if you have... Uh, a, a system where you can actually get them to the final and they can produce the results, then the system on excellence speaks for itself. So I think we can apply that principle not just to women, we can apply it to widening, for example, in the European mm. Union, we can apply it to any other kind of issue that you want. And then finally, you know, I'm very fond of saying that scientists love evidence in all policy except science policy, in which case any old anecdote will do. So if you look at science policy, and you analyze in giving out grants, then peer review is pretty good at telling you what you should fund and what you should not fund, but it is not very good at the rank order of the fundable projects. In fact, there is no correlation between the rank order and the subsequent outcome of the projects. So what that tells you is you can use other criteria to help in the final assessment. Gender may be one of them, race may be another, geography may be another. It's still an excellence principle. So I think we need to embrace that, and I think we need to address it. Where there's a real job of work to do is in investors. There are very few funds that are run by women. So most investment funds are one run by men, and that's where the real issue, the real challenge for us is, as well as with the entrepreneurs. Thank you, Mark. Maria, your reaction to that? Very, very interesting. Um, and I think you made an important point. First of all, of course, I agree entirely with Anna. We should not say the future is one kind or another, it belongs to all of us. That's what diversity is about. So we must represent, have the diversity represented because the talent is spread equally among people. Uh, we just have to find it. And that actually brings me to a point that I find very important. Um, one lack of diversity is that many of us, I see, I look at this end of the stage, are like I said, you know, we're senior, we're old, Of course, we have a lot of experience that we bring to the table, and that helps. But fortunately, this panel has some diversity and has younger people. I think that's often missing. And I think we need to bring in more younger people. They think differently. Of course, old people who are successful promote the criteria that have brought them there. That was a success. So I think that's missing. We need more of young people in decision-making bodies. But perhaps even more importantly, and that was also illustrated by Anna's um, example, is that we give people access to education equally and equitably. Of course, for males and females, that's true in Europe. But in many countries, education still costs a lot of money. Um, your, the, the parents' socioeconomic background determines who gets education. So I think we have to start way lower And young people are also less set in their minds. So I think everything starts very young. And the girls in Oman are a fantastic example. Let's see them grow up and change their country. But we've got to do the same. 
Okay, I mean, this is now the first time that in a panel I'm, uh, I'm challenged on, uh, on um, um, generational diversity. It's a very good point, uh, Maria. Uh, so I think it's an excellent point. You yeah. know, missions are part of the European uh, horizon in Europe, and people often talk about uh, the man on the moon. Yeah. So what was the average age, the average age of all employees on NASA when they put a man on the moon? Answer, 26. Oh. The average age was 26. Young people put a man on the moon. How many times do you hear that said? That's an amazing... 26? I, I, is, this, is this a hard... Yeah, it, it must be a hard fact if, you, if you're bringing it forward, Mark. That's quite... That's a quite I, I'll use it again. You, said you, you, you can comment on the future as she made, but it's broadening already, so don't hesitate. Yeah, it's, it's actually uh, maybe a funny story to tell. When I started my business, we were hiring the same age, so it was 23. And we thought, like, oh, we are a young uh, company. But the older we became, the same age we were hiring. So at this moment, we are hiring 30 plus. And then I thought, like, I told to the MT, like, guys, do you, do you see we are becoming one of them? We are just doing the same. We are hiring the same kind of people with the same age. So that's when we decided to take a very young person and put it in the management team without any experience in managing. But that's what we needed. And, and she is doing an amazing job already for three years. So it's, it's sometimes you need to dare to, to challenge yourself with, with, with some, doing something which is not the standard. Quickly get back yes, to yes, there. yes, yes. So that's wonderful. That's great. And it's an individual who took that initiative. What worries me is that many of the uh, top down decisions are made by old people like us. And they are invariably old. And they're going to determine our future. I mean, I try to stay away from that. I do too, of course. I'm the head of an organization. Um, but I think that's a problem. And that actually is also, conversely, the. Um, defense for letting research that might or might not one day uh, lead to innovation be happening from the bottom up because the young people vote with their feet. They know what are the exciting fields. They know where the future is much better than we do. So again, uh, a plea for that individual bravery and letting young people vote with their feet. Mm -hmm. Well, Translating I, this, sorry to interrupt, no, no, um, into, for example, the situation right now that we have with underinvested women entrepreneurs and women-led companies uh, in Europe. Um, essentially, what we uh, what we see right now is, as we mentioned, it's uh, 0.7 actually uh, companies that are funded, women-led companies that are funded, but what we really want to is enable and equip these particular young generations because we want the system to regenerate them itself. Because these women entrepreneurs, if we, with them being so more and, and better performing, they will be, uh, they will have an exit and then they will come, be they, they will become women angel investors. And like this, we will have more participation, for example, from, exa exactly. So we will have a better participation yeah. of the group that is right now in the, in the spotlight. Yeah. And that applies probably to other elements of diversity. I'm sure we'll come back to that. Let me just give you one comment on my side is that um, the female, the future is not female as the present is too male. I completely agree with that. But I think, uh, as, as you said, we need to invest in, in female uh, talent. And I think in innovation particularly, for the reasons said, including in IT-related uh, innovation, uh, where I think the situation is most problematic, frankly, because it is uh, um, not so old uh, young white nerds which are creating the society of tomorrow through their algorithms. And I'm not entirely sure that's a society I feel completely comfortable in. But that's, uh, I think, one very specific dimension to the, to the debate. At EU level, we have focused with a degree of success, but we still need to do uh, the groundwork on innovation on gender diversity. Um, uh, but as uh, you all said, huh, uh, there, there is, of course, a much broader uh, challenge on diversity, which is indeed geographical. I think you, you, you used the, the, the word race, uh, yes. Mark, which is a word which in France is, French is a bit more difficult to use, so I always struggle a bit, but yes, race, geographical diversity, uh, socioeconomic diversity, maybe even more so, are a real challenge in science, but also in innovation. We are losing out, no doubt. So how can we tackle that? Who wants to start? 
Yeah, so during, uh, I, was, I was in the advisory board for about two years, yeah. and uh, part of my job there was uh, sharing the work group with the question, how can we make diversity more stronger within the EIC? And it's, it's a very hard question to answer. So even with the experts on the table, we had come up with ideas, but honestly speaking, it comes from the mindset first. So part of what we need to do is we need to show diversity. We need to show role models. We need to educate the people like diversity. It's really important. You should not do it for your image because without the diversity, your company is not going to do great anyway. And that's actually part of the solution what we need to do. Should we, should we look at diversity as a criteria to assess the quality of the teams behind the innovators? Are we doing it, Mark? I don't think we are. So I think, you know, I think investors will do that. And if you're looking at products, I mean, if you're selling a product, well, 50% of your market is female and 50% of it is male. And you know, a good part of your market has, is of people of different uh, skin color. A good part of your market is of people of different age. So you really need to embrace that to, to see will your product be successful. So I think it really comes to the fundamentals. But, but Yusuf put his finger on it, you know, that, that we like to associate with, uh, with people that we know as a kind of human characteristic. And you need to actively get out of that and say, actually, it's really interesting to, to associate with people that you don't know or people that are different. And you even see that in the coronavirus crisis. To give you a very topical example, if you look at uh, public surveys, people feel unsafe on public transport but they feel safe sitting in a pub talking to somebody that they know despite the fact that somebody else in, the, in there could be spreading the virus. And this is completely the reverse of the risk because on public transport, you're only exposed to people for a few moments, uh, a few minutes, uh, whereas if you're sitting in a restaurant or a pub, you may be there for an hour or two, but it illustrates how when we become anxious or we come back, we, we actually become fearful of strangers. And and overcoming that fear of strangers, I think, is a conscious decision. It's really saying, I want to embrace this because it's going to be more interesting going forward. Yep. And that's probably an active decision. Yeah, that's cultural, psychological. Huh? It's yep. not yet a hard, uh, a hard measure. Huh? Uh, Maria, you have ideas? I think the cultural uh, psychological is actually totally underestimated. And I must say, I until recently underestimated it. So just looking at the company, whether they have you know, the right number of non-Caucasians or whatever you want to call them, males, females, transgender, that's not sufficient. I recently attended a conference on diversity run by the Bosch Foundation where they really assembled people from all over the world, from fantastic Africa and Malaysia and everywhere. And a good anecdote was mentioned. You know, it's all very fine to be invited to the table but once we're at, sitting at the table, the story's not over. You've got to enter our mind of thinking. And they had a very good um, metaphor, you know. You're inviting us to the ball, but nobody's asking us to dance. And I think that's the important thing. It's not sufficient. And I just heard the head of a big uh, research organization introduce a new colleague uh, among the faculty saying, we're so proud we now have our first black member of faculty. That is so beside the point. I mean, yeah. it's embarrassing. So it is, the, yes. the, it's not sufficient to just look and count and say we can take off our diversity box. We have to enter the mind of our, peop of, of, of our colleagues who are different from us and allow them to contribute, ask them to contribute. Only then do we begin to benefit from diversity. That's an excellent point. Anna. Thanks. So I think it, overall, in the end, everyone wants um, a good return on their investment. And um, for this, we need to go to the core of the problem. And Maria has already um, mentioned this previously. It's about the decision making and about the senior positions. So um, I think uh, from my perspective, and we have seen in, in the like last four or five years, uh, emerging different initiatives, for example, specifically for women like Rising Tide, so VC led by women, uh, for example, the European Women in VC. Then we have a great program uh, led by Natalia Novinska, which is uh, Women Tech EU. So we are trying to have this uh, critical mass of women. But in reality, what we really need is uh, the European Commission to give a clear mandate to the EIF and um, connected to, to incentives. 
So e essentially, um, the idea is obviously to have more diversity, more inclusion. So if we have not only a focus on good returns, but we have this focus on good returns, which is fueled by the diversity and, and inclusive groups, and we connect this to the management fees, which are increased or decreased based on the results of the investments, I think, for example, that is one that could be one potential solution where we can really, um, you know, uh, change, level the playing field. Because, you know, we can talk about the success stories, we can talk about role models, we can talk about education, and for example, bias. I think this is really important because there was um, recently uh, a research that came out which is called We Ask Men to Win and We Ask Women Not to Lose. So when investors talk to women entrepreneurs, they will ask them preventive focused questions. Whereas when they talk to men entrepreneurs, they will ask them stuff like, oh, so what do you plan on achieving? You know, so, so it's, it's, a, it's a very um, complex question, but I think it needs, to, uh, it needs to be tackled at the core. No, that's absolutely correct. I mean, in, in evaluations in the EU system, the gender biases uh, are part of the briefing to evaluators. Huh? It's, I mean, at least that step is taken. How deeply this then impacts the quality of the reviews is, an, is of course, another matter. Um, so, in, 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 in our setup, we, we, we don't do positive discrimination, we do positive actions. And, uh, Mark, you explained uh, briefly how uh, the EIC pilot uh, was able to progressively ramp up uh, the number of uh, female-led companies at interview stage without this then leading uh, to discriminatory outcomes in terms of the excellence. Uh, I mean, are there any other concrete uh, measures which you could think of, the four of you, huh, which uh, the EIC could look into uh, to improve the score on this broad set of diversity requirements? So I think unconscious bias is really important. And it is what it says on the tin. It's unconscious. So, you know, if you ask most people who have unconscious bias, are you biased? They'll say no. Mm. That's by definition. Yeah. And one thing that we have done in Science Foundation Ireland that actually we will probably repeat in the European Innovation Council is before every jury, you run a very short unconscious bias video. There's actually an excellent one from the Royal Society. It only runs for a couple of minutes, but it reminds people that they need to pay attention to unconscious bias. And then at the end of the evaluation, you ask yourself the same question. It doesn't necessarily uh, solve the problem, but it helps to bring it to the front of mind uh, when, when, because you are dealing with stuff that is unconscious by definition. So you sort of need to be reminded about it, and you need to be reminded about it a lot. I think that's true. And the ERC runs a similar movie at the beginning of each panel meeting. <clears throat> and there are studies, I think it was a French study, that showed for a panel even to be reminded of unconscious bias, even if people aren't asked whether they think they're biased or not, helps. So that's really good. I have also have to say I've seen in both organizations, um, in, in EMBO at, at first hand and uh, at the ERC, I just saw the selection results from this year, the proportion of women is rising, so awareness has, uh, has had an effect. In our EMBO membership elections, women are, and this is an anonymous election, so nobody has to do anything for show, women do disproportionately massively better than men. So the awareness is there, but like I say, and so you know, we will see women uh, coming to the fore. We had two senior politicians here this, uh, this afternoon, both female. Um, but I really think it's time to look at the other criteria. I think we're doing pretty good with women and the awareness is there, numbers are changing. I, I nevertheless applaud the EIC uh, um, uh, approach. But we really, how do we get all the others in? How do we get the people who are coming into Europe as refugees now, how do we get them to be innovators, entrepreneurs in five or ten years? How, we, how do we deal with the people who live in parts of Brussels uh, that are difficult? I, I really think that will do us much more good if we start concentrating on that now. Yes, I do agree with you 100%. Like Diversity is broader than female. And, and also for disabled people and older men, uh, all the white men, till now, they are in the top, but they feel a lot of 
uh, a lot of pressure from the outside world. So I, I think we really need to include everyone in the mission because diversity is not like choosing one kind and, and focusing on it. Uh, it's still a very hard to, to let people with different backgrounds cooperate uh, together on something big. But I think once we, will, once we will set the standard, and we did that somehow also during our meetings, Mark, in, in, the, in the IC yes. board. Like we said, okay, we, if, 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 if the founders team is not diverse, they need to explain why. Why do they really think if they are three young people, all the same age, with the same education, with the same background, they are going to make it? While all the scientific studies is proven, diverse founders will do much better. So I think it, we, we need to be bold and to say, explain yourself. If you are not diverse, why do you really think you are going to make it while all the science is against you? Sing it, huh? That would be an interesting way of, of starting a conversation in an evaluation panel, I must say. That's quite interesting. Anna, wh wh what can you, can you help us? Well, I would, I would say one of the, we were talking here about the intergroup bias and some other uh, blind spot biases, but um, essentially, I think one really important one is risk aversion. Mm -hmm. And we do things in the same way because we are basically afraid to fail, right? So if we already have like a recipe that is successful, um, we are going to go with the same people all over again. And then intergroup bias, familiarity will jump in. And I really think that, you know, if you have clear incentives and clear mandates to avoid this risk, and you create a more inclusive framework, for example, for, for the investments uh, of the EIF, for example, I'm not, I'm not focusing only on women. I mean, it's an interesting topic because now women are in, in the spotlight, right? But uh, I think one of the other issues is, for example, geographical diversity of companies that are being funded by the EIC Accelerator. Or, for example, then we're going again to the ethnical, uh, e generational gaps, etc. So I think there is a lot of issues that we need to address. And basically all the, all the science, as we're saying, it's on our side because apparently diversity fuels innovation. So I think we need to be bold enough and you know, go over that risk, especially as investors, because you know, by definition, Investors should not be risk averse. Okay, the message I think is very clear. So, can can I see whether this resonates with the room or, or the audience more generally? I have a couple of questions, but they are not particularly related to the uh, panel itself. So, is there anyone um, who wants to come into the discussion here in Auto World? Yes, we have one question here in the front. We have micros, I think, which are premier rangé, là juste devant, troisième rangé, madame. Voilà, thank you. Is it working? Yeah. Okay, women are normally assessed on performance for leadership roles, and the bias is that we are not actually able to lead in general. And how you tackle that, and the second thing for the European Commission, because it is true, it is fundamental to have women forward and to maybe make it a... a an element, a component for the evaluation itself and even other forms of diversities. But there are a lot of people who think, is it not going to affect quality in the decisions? How do we, how do you tackle all this? Well, I think in terms of quality of the decision, a parity can only improve it. Uh, and in fact, at, uh, at EU level, uh, our expert groups, our evaluator pools, uh, uh, the uh, Scientific Council of the ERC, uh, the management of DG Research and Innovation, we are all at parity already, huh? and I think that needs to become a, a given and uh, can only enhance the quality. But maybe more generally, you, you, Mark, you wanted to react. So I was going to say, you know, slightly on this point, I mean, I think it doesn't affect the quality in the fact that we uh, said that we would have a certain number of female-led companies come to the interview stage. At the interview stage, it was absolutely an excellence. And the companies founded were excellent, so, so I actually don't agree that it, it affects the quality. I think we need to do bold social experiments. I mean, what did the Israelis do when they had a million Jewish people come to the state of Israel from uh, the Soviet Union in, in pre-Soviet uh, uh, Union times? They put them into incubators, they taught them entrepreneurship, they taught them Hebrew, and they also taught them how to network in the, in the Israeli society, those three things. And those people are now high density of today's entrepreneurs. Because as a refugee, if you've packed up 
all your belongings and gone to a different country, you are by definition an entrepreneurial mindset. You're a risk taker. So, you know, where is that in our, our kind of social policy? And I did an experiment in Ireland uh, at the peak of the economic crisis when you can do things, when everybody is absolutely in the shit, you can do high risk things. And I took people who'd been on the long term unemployment list for more than two years, had no university education, and who would have been written off at any kind of selection process at the first cut because they didn't have a higher education and they'd been unemployed for two years. I got a, a company to partner with us to uh, teach them digital skills. And I managed to persuade the most difficult thing, the Department of Social Protection, to continue to pay them unemployment benefit. That was the most difficult thing to do. Mm -hmm. And at the end of it, the company could either hire the people or not at the end of the year. And at the end of the year, they hired 100% of those people. And if you go back into that company now, 10 years later, you will see, and you talk to the company, they say they're the most reliable uh, employees. They are, feel a sense of loyalty because they were given a chance. It's made a generational change for the state, a huge benefit in terms of long-term unemployment and social uh, uh, distress. So that breaks kind of a prejudice that even I would have, okay? Let's admit it. I would say this person wasn't educated. We tested a hypothesis that actually that didn't matter. And the hypothesis was that those people had left school at the peak of the Celtic Tiger to go into construction to make a load of money that was a kind of sensible decision, but it didn't work out in the long term for them. So I think we need to do more bolder social experiments and, and take more of a risk about how we approach training such people, um, whether they be refugees or elsewhere. And that's actually hard because it's politically very hard because there's always some problem somewhere. Nothing works perfectly and you always have some problem and that problem then throws doubt over the whole new program. So we just need to be brave to try to do that and, and that would be my uh, two cents worth in terms of how you get more inclusion. But by definition, people who are refugees have an entrepreneurial high risk mindset because they've packed up their entire livelihoods and gone to a different country. How many people think of it that way? Not many. Anyone wants to come in? Did you scale up uh, this successful experiment? Did Ireland scale up this rather remarkable experiment? No, no. So that just tells you the kind of um, uh, conservative mindset. I mean, it was very, uh, very impressive, but the conservative forces that are at play in many, many social uh, situations, social policy, are such that you know, people find it difficult to understand how you, can't give, how you can give people unemployment benefit if they're actually being trained, and, and all these kind of artificial rules that when you're in a deep crisis actually can go out the window and you can do experiments, but when you're in normal times, you kind of revert to that uh, thing. So I keep reminding my colleagues of this from time to time. Yeah, and we are certainly not in normal times, so there's maybe space for a, a little bit more risk-taking. Does anyone else uh, wish to come in? Yes, uh, we have someone in the back, in, in red, seen from here. Donc, au fond de la salle, au milieu, en rouge. Merci. Hello, my name is Angela Stathi, and I have the pleasure to be one of you, the ESC experts. Um, my question to you, perhaps a comment, is that I think Anna mentioned that we are trying to invest in women so they can become the next angel investors. Uh, my view is that this will take a bit of time until this reaches to the stage that they will have an exit and become an angel investor. Are we trying to create perhaps some certain programs in order to initiate more women to set up VCs, a program that will teach them how to become the next VC investor. We are indeed, huh, Mark, aren't we? Absolutely, and I'm looking at Kinga, who's right in the audience there, who's leading an initiative on, uh, on VC, women VCs, and getting more an investment into VC companies. Kinga, why don't you answer the question? Um, if you can bring the microphone to the lady who's you here. Be, um, on a un micro du côté droit de la salle, enfin du côté gauche, non Donc pour le micro, si vous pouvez l'amener à l'avant, est-ce qu'on peut avoir un micro pour l'avant de la salle, pour la dame debout, toujours en rouge d'ailleurs Voilà, merci. Red is the color of the speakers. Kinga, over to you. 
Thanks so much. Thanks, Mark. Um, well, I, I think first of all, there is a big group of women who are already starting to set up VC funds. Um, this year was an incredible year. For the first time, we have a 500 million fund in France set up by two ladies. We have a 250 million fund in France, stroke Germany, set up by another two ladies. And a 90 million fund in Iceland set up by three ladies. Um, that's never happened before. Under the leadership of the commissioner of Maria Gabriel, we have a group of 26 female general partners, each one representing a different European country. And we are working together to change the status quo because today only around 4 to 5% of assets under management are managed in Europe by women. So this is something that is very close to both the heart of the commissioner and my EIC colleagues. And there is a lot of work time of everyone being put into this subject because what has proven is that women tend to invest in women three to four times more often. Those women then hire other women in technology six times more often. So there is a huge effect that can really change the shape of Europe. Plus, women invest differently. Women invest in healthcare. Women invest in biotech, life science, green, clean energy, education. So a lot of impact investments are actually carried out by women. And we do want to see more of that. So I hope that next year at the next EIC summit, we'll have a lot more to talk about on that front. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, and I think uh, this illustrates, but also what you've heard from the panel, that we are making a headway into gender diversity and getting to gender parity broadly, but also with these very specific instruments. And dear panel members, I would, I would argue that we can most certainly inspire ourselves from these measures which produce uh, results and which hopefully will uh, uh, generate this positive uh, spiral uh, which you described, Anna, earlier on. Can, and we, let's close with that um, to the four of you. Do you think we can use these, um, these positive benchmarks to make progress on other uh, elements of diversity? Anna, maybe you can start and then we come back sure. to Maria and Claire. Absolutely. So, yes, I absolutely agree. And I think uh, to your point, to the first question, um, you know, quality is always uh, the priority, quality over quantity, but we need to have the quality of chance first. So that would be my takeaway point. I can echo that, absolutely. But also, like, if we really care about diversity, it needs to start from all of us. Like in our position, in, in our companies, we need to practice that. And, and we should not wait till the government will do that for us. I agree. I think we should do more experiments and we should be uh, uh, pleased to, to think of that. I think we all need to think fundamentally about it. But optimistically, I think we're on the right road and we've got increasing speed, but we're not yet at the destination. Yes, I obviously also agree. I do not see a concern about quality. Diversity is about enhancing quality. It's about fairness first, of course. Most importantly, it's about fairness. Everybody should have access. Everybody should have the equal chances. But as we've heard, there are studies that diversity improves quality. So I don't see any, uh, any, any reason to fear um, only chances. I can safely conclude that the uh, newly established EIC board has as part of its mandate to make headway beyond gender diversity across all forms of diversity and will come back in a year to report back. Thank you very much.